Okay, so to, this morning we are going to be speaking on a subject title, Wisdom to Navigate and Survive the Season of Famine. The Wisdom to Navigate and Survive the Season of Famine. It's important to first get an understanding of what famine is. It's important to first get an insight and understanding of what farming is. Farming has to do with scarcity. When supply is not much, when demand is more than supply. And so the resources that are available will be scarce. And because of that scarcity, a lot of people's needs will not be met. And so, there's famine. And more often than not, we use it when we describe supply of food. You know, when what a particular society needs to cater for the food needs of its people is not enough. And so people have to eat their food in rationing. They can't eat as much as they want to eat. They only eat as is available. And in economic, you probably call it um, economic downtown, when the economy is not good, when things are not, uh, the economy is not buoyant, people don't have enough money, the purchasing power is low, and people don't have enough to do what they would have loved to do or what they want to achieve. They, can't, they don't have resources materially to achieve them. And amongst, uh, what we're going to do this morning is to look at what the scripture has to say about farming and then how they will handle farming. Okay, so I'd like you to join me in the book of Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, to see that God actually established seasons of life. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22. Genesis chapter 8. Maybe you, maybe you lock that door so that it doesn't keep giving you that effect. Genesis chapter 8, are we there? And verse 22. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 22. I'd like us to read together. This is God speaking now, and it says, While the earth remained, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. You know, what God established there is to establish seasons. Are you following me at all now? He established seasons. That is to say, you know, when you read the, the verse ahead of it, God was talking about the fact that when God smelled the sacrifice of, I mean, of Noah, and the Bible talked about the fact that God saw that the imagination of men were continually evil and all of that, and God was saying, I won't cause the earth again, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to ensure that I create seasons. Are you following me at all now? So that there will be seasons in the lives of men. There will be times of surplus, there will be times of scarcity, there will be time men will have to plant, there will be time men will have to sow, and all of that. that. There will be cycles in the life of men. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon helped us to see, because now that, that establishment of men, are, I mean of God, had, had, had now become something that is operational. And so in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, you hear um, Solomon talk about the same thing from verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Verse 1 and 2. And it says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. So technically, you can say here that Solomon is helping us to see that there are times and seasons on this earth. So there will be times of surplus, and there will be times of scarcity. Am I making sense, Otona? There will be times of surplus, and there will be times of scarcity. Now, when you now look at the, men, the stories of men, biblical history, when you look at the stories of men that God had to do one thing or the other, with, starting with a man called Abraham, you will see that in every generation, there was a famine. 
Starting with Abraham, there was famine in the days of Abraham. And the Bible says Abraham went into Egypt because there was famine in his days. And then when you get to Genesis chapter 26, the Bible tells us that there was famine in the day of Isaac. That was different from the famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Abraham, I mean, Isaac planned to move. And God said, no, I don't want you to move. I want to stay in this land that I will show you. Then when we move further, you, you see in Genesis, I think, uh, um, 39, thereabout, there was another famine. 39, 40, there was another famine in the times of Jacob. The famine that made the whole of the family of Jacob to move to the land of Egypt. So which means famine is not a new thing. Are you following me, Antonio? I'm sure that many of us have heard that um, the price of fuel had gone up and then so a lot of panic for so many people. It is at such a time like this that we need to understand how do I survive as someone who has a relationship with God. Especially when you look at it, when things like this are happening and you look, you look at your income and your income is not equal to your expenses. Are you following me, Antonio? When you look at, I think they say a, um, a bowl of rice is how much now? That's, um, eh? That, that Congo, I don't know what they call it, a paint rubber, okay, paint rubber here. 7,000 plus. So how many cups of rice do you have there? No, cups. How many? 20 cups of rice. Okay, so 20 cups in a rubber. So that would be like how much for a cup? 7,005 divided by 20. That would give us what? Less? 375. So, so 375 naira is one cup of rice. Are you following me, Antona? And, and, and you can imagine that one cup of rice will not fill somebody like this man. <laughs> you give me a cup of rice, or you want, to, you want to serve a tea, and then you give a tea, one cup of rice. He's just going to look and say, what is this nonsense? Are you following me, Antona? Okay. So which means, averagely, a person probably will want to go for two cups of rice. And if Dove is in a good mood, he probably might take three cups. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And, 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 and then when you consider the way the prices of a lot of things are going up, some of you will probably have to take transport from um, your houses to your place of work. Some of those transportation have gone up extra. And then when you look at the cost of transportation and then you take it out of your salary, you probably will feel what then is left. Okay, so I'm eating the right thing now. Okay. Now, if care is not taken, you can be so focused on the pain and the challenges of, of famine that you will lose your sight on God and your hope and your confidence will be lost. And then you get to a point where you begin to speak the way other people speak. How will I survive? Are you following me, Antona? The noise you hear all around is everybody is wondering, ah, this hardship is, oh, this, ah, this thing is terrible, oh, ah, hey, and all that. And people are just wondering, how will I survive? What will not happen to me? And then to worsen the matter, the landlords are also increasing the house rents. Are you following me, Antona? Some houses are going up by 50%. Are you following me at all? Some are even going as much as 70%. Some are going 100%. And they will tell you, and you say, why? They say, you know what, is, what the nation is talking about. And then if you have kids, then school fees are skyrocketing. Am I making sense at all now? Uh, so almost the cost of everything is going up here and there. And then your income is not increasing at the same rate at which those things are going up. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It is at such point that we that have relationship with God must know exactly what we are involved with. And the Bible tells us that they that do know their God shall be strong and do exploit. Secondly, the reality is that we are not like them that do not have hope. When you have a relationship with God, you have hope. Come and say, I have hope. I have hope. 
I am not hopeless. I can't hear you, but I am not hopeless. Those of us who have God, who have a relationship with God, we are not hopeless. And why are we not hopeless? Is that no matter how hard, no matter how bad the economy is, no matter how difficult the situation is, God has every plan for us. In fact, the Bible says he has a plan to take care of us even in famine, in the difficult times. And I'll show you that from the scripture quickly. I said that door should actually be taken care of so that it, it keeps opening and keeps locking. Okay. Psalms chapter 33. Psalms chapter 33. Psalms 33, are you there? Psalms chapter 33. I like us to look at verse 18. Psalms chapter 33 and verse 18. Psalm 33. Are you there at all? If you are there, I'd like us to read from verse 18. If I don't read from 18, I think it will, it will be good to read from verse 16. Then you will appreciate the whole of that scripture. Psalms chapter 33 from verse 16. And it says, There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall it deliver any by his great strength. Can we read verse 18 very loudly? Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. Read verse 19 loudly, very loud, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive. Come and say, God will keep me alive in this economic challenge. Are you following me at all? No? The Bible says the eyes of the Lord is upon them that fear him. To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. And I love the exclamation of the psalmist in verse 20. Because of this reality, look at what the psalmist said in verse 20. Can, we, can you say that like you mean it? Want to go? Personalize it. Personalize it. Personalize it. Want to go? My soul. Wait for the Lord. He is your help. Are you following me, Antonio? Come and say, the Lord is my help in this season and is my protection from the hardship of this season. Say it again. The Lord is my help in this season and is my protection from the hardship of this season. Now, take note of this. Our relationship with God is not just for religious sake. We are not Christian just by brand. We are a people who have relationship with a God who is alive. He's a living God. And what it means to say he's a living God is that he's a God that is actively at work. He's a spirit that is dependable. One of his attributes is that he is a faithful God. He is what? He's a faithful God. There's a song that we sing in this house. You are dependable at all times. You are dependable at all times. Hell shall die, God Almighty. You are dependable. Ah, all time you are dependable Lord you are dependable ah, all times you are dependable God you are dependable at all times oh hell shall die God Almighty Jehovah you are dependable ah, all time is ever dependable. Are you following me at all? Now take note, God is not just one person that is inside the sky and then that left us here to just be suffering or whatever happens to you, chances, anything. The day that you want to jam you, you jam you. The day you have food to eat, you have food to eat. The day you don't have food to eat, you don't have food to eat. No, no, no. God is not like that. 
when a person has relationship with God and that person is conscious that he is connected to God, is conscious of the existence of God, which is what the Bible calls the fear of God. Once you are a person that is conscious of God, your mind is aware that you are not just another person. You are someone who has a relationship with God. Guess what happens? God begins to pay attention to your affairs and he will be directing things in your favor. That's why he said the eyes of God are upon them that fear him and that hope in his mercy. What does it mean to hope in his mercy? To be expecting God to do you good. Are you following me at all now? You daily wake up and say, God, I thank you. I'm expecting a good thing to come in my direction. I'm just expecting a miracle today. I'm expecting that God is going to move all over the world to bless me today. I'm just expecting. And guess what? To take care of you is never God's problem. Are you still with me here? Taking care of you is never God's problem. The whole of the universe, including everywhere on planet Earth, God is in control. Do you know as we cry and complain in Nigeria, for example, now, all you just need at this your level is God to just slap somebody in America or Canada to send you $20,000 $20, every month. You know, part of your pain will just go. <laughs> Issue about food will just not be on your head anymore. Just imagine God tell somebody and say, I want to be doing this to this person. And then the person says, I don't know what is happening, but I just, I just feel like giving you a job. And then what's your job? Just um, help me fill this form. I'll pay you $20,000 every month. And then you look at the thing to be filling. Under one hour, you are through. It's not the job. It's that God is looking for means to bless you. That's all. Are you following me at all? And it costs God nothing to make it happen. I'm telling you the honest truth. It doesn't cost him anything to make it happen. It doesn't cost God anything to touch anybody anywhere all over the universe to create a channel to bless your life. So what God is looking for is who are the people who will hope, who will expect God to do them good. Said so the eyes of God is looking for those who hope on his mercy. In the book of um, Chronicles, the Bible says, I think in 1 Chronicles 16, the Bible says the eyes of God move through and through the earth looking for them whose heart is perfect towards him that he may show himself mighty. You see, the, the, the challenge is that the invisibility of God, the fact that we cannot see God, often makes our life challenging because in, I mean, we can't, our not being able to see him make us so easily forget that he's actively involved in our lives. Because our minds oftentimes reduce our life to the things that we can see. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't even know. The, the, my salary is not even enough. You know. Look at now. I earn, look at how much I earn. Look at how much my rent is. All of those things are things that you can see. But can you for a minute just remember that there is a God that you cannot see who is also planning your life? Are you following me at all now? Can I help you a little more? What you need to take care of your life, they are not all that you will be able to see where they are coming from. Can I repeat myself? What you need to take care of your life, which God has provided, has planned them, you will not know and you will not see all of them at the same time. Some of the things that you will need, which God has already taken care of, they will come on the day that you need them. Are you following me at all now? It is good to plan, but many times God can mess up your plan. How will he mess up your plan? There are factors that God has that you cannot plan into the equation. All you can do is to say, God, I'm expecting you to come through for me. Are you following me at all? Now? And that is why the Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone that is relating with God must believe, must know that God exists. And that God is a reward of them that diligently seek Him. What does it mean that He's a reward of them that diligently seek Him? It means that if you believe and agree that God exists, though you cannot see Him, if you will put your heart on God, God will pay you. God will show up. He will not disappoint and put you to shame. That's what it means. And I'm telling you the honest truth. Some of us have lived, I mean, I've lived a good portion of my life on this lane. And I can tell you, God has never disappointed me once. It, it sometimes looks like a risky journey. 
But if you can learn to trust God, that God is not sleeping over your life. So the Bible says the eyes of God is looking, is watching. Can we read that scripture again? Psalm 33. Let's get back there. Psalm 33. Are we there? I want us to look at verse 18 again. 18 to 19. Are you there? Want to go? Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. Upon them that hope in his mercy. What does he do? To deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. That means it will sustain you. It will take care of you. It will ensure that even if the price of fuel goes to 2000 he knows what to do to take care of you. Are you following me, Atona? It's not sleeping. So the first thing is that you must learn not to be worried the way the people in the world are worried. Because once you get into worry, you will walk out of faith. Can I help your mind a little bit? Stop thinking your life depends on your salary. I repeat, stop thinking your life depends on your salary. The moment you continue to think your life depends on your salary, you will have a lot of problem, a lot of worry. Why? Because you are going to look at the needs and the demands in your life, and you are going to look at your salary, and they will not equate. And the implication of your salary and your needs not equating is that you will begin to worry where the deficit will be filled up from. But when it comes to God, he knows how to take care of you. Are you following me, Antona? He knows exactly what to do. He knows where to fix what from. All he's expecting you to do is to trust him and hope in his mercy. Expect him to show you kindness in the land of the living. One more scripture of, to show you that God has already figured it out. Job chapter 5, verse 20. Job chapter 5. These were the scriptures that God gave to us um, sometimes this year. And I'm doing well to remind you of this scripture again. That God has your life planned out. Okay, so there's no need to worry. Look at yourself and say, Shagun, there's no need to worry. Say it again. Shagun, there's no need to worry. Job chapter 5. Are we there? Okay, let's pick it from verse 19 to 20. One to go. It shall deliver thee in six troubles. Yea, in seven, there shall no evil touch thee. Verse 21, and um, 20 loudly. In farming, what will he do? In other words, while this season may be destroying many people, God will make sure that he takes you out of it. Are you following me, Antona? It will protect you in the midst of this season. In the midst of this hour. So which means, even if you have to spend the whole of your salary on transportation, and it looks as if there is no other means by which resources will come, the Bible is saying, God, God has the plan to ensure that he redeems you from death. Your business won't go down because this economy is bad. That's what he's saying. Yes, I agree that some people, their businesses will go down, and the only reason why they will not sell anymore is that the times are difficult. But here, God is saying, I'm going to redeem you from death. In other words, you are, you are supposed to be among those who, whose business you crash. But what I will do is that I will intervene and take your own case out. So when a person has relationship with God, first rule is that you don't fear what others fear. Are you following me at all? You don't what? And you don't panic. Why they are panicking? Because everyone says, hey, fuel. You know, there's a way that thing can be transferable. Ah, he, how much is a Ojota to Ikeja now? He, Ojota to Ikeja that we used to take at 15 era. Now 300. So to and fro will now be 600. In a month, how much is that? How much am I earning? 
Are you following me at all? And that panic will create worry. And then most people cannot put their confidence in God. But I tell you, no matter how terrible it is, God always has a plan for those who belong to him in the midst of famine. And what I want to do this morning is to show you examples. And then we go through how do you survive when you are in famine? What are the things that you should do? Let's take the first example is Abraham. During the famine period in the time of Abraham, God preserved Abraham. Hello? And I know that God will preserve you this season. I thought I would hear a better amen. amen. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. Are you there? Verse 10. Genesis chapter 12. Are we there? Verse 10. Can we read? Want to go? There was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. The famine was grievous in the land. Jump to chapter 13, verse 1 to 2. One to go. And Abraham went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lord with him into the south. Verse 2, loudly. When, when, when there is famine, what should happen to people? They should be poor. Isn't it? When there is famine, people should be poor. But look at Abraham, at the end of it all, the Bible says Abraham was rich. Because in famine, God has an alternate plan. Let's look at the man called Isaac, who is the son of Abraham, so that you get the concept. I'm, I'm trying to build up something for you to help you to see that God always has a plan that is different for his children. So you are not like everybody. Everybody is complaining. Yes, I agree. The fuel price has gone up. Yes, I agree. It is biting hard on everybody. I agree. But when you belong to God, your case is different. Come on, say my case is different. And listen, I'm not, look up, look up, look up. I'm not trying, you know, there are these social media guys will start telling people, hey, don't let pastors motivate you and deceive you. De -de 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 -de. The reality is that we are serving a God that is alive. And if he is truly alive, it will mean he is not intelligent to be, that he's not thinking about us. Meanwhile, our God, because he's alive, is a mighty God. We are not talking about a God that is like a man. We are talking about a God whose hand can touch anything anywhere in the universe. Are you following me, Antona? It will not be that, okay, let's go somewhere. The trouble that Nigeria is facing, are they facing it all over the world? Huh? No. Maybe in a different way. But what, what is happening to us in Nigeria is not what they are facing in the US. It's not what they are facing in the UK. It's not what they are facing in France. Are you going to understand? Every nation has its own challenge. But what is happening now is not what is happening to them there. Are you following me at all now? And that's why you could have uncles, brothers in the US, in the UK, when they send dollar home now, the thing looks like every money. God doesn't have any problem, I repeat, to take care of you is never God's problem. It's the least of his problem. And he can go, he can choose to leave Nigeria and go to Afghanistan to be bringing your supply. Are you following me at all now? So, when you now reduce God to Nigerian problem, it's an insult on his integrity. That's what I'm trying to say to you. And what we often have as a situation is that because of the talk and the way most people will talk about the problem, it can get to you that you too will start thinking that you are in problem like them. Meanwhile, once you have a relationship with God, you are not in the same category with people who don't have a relationship with God. 
Are you following me at all? When you have a relationship with God, there is a supernatural hand of God that begins to work in your favor. There is a spirit, the spirit of God, that moves on the earth to go and walk in your favor. Once you have a relationship with God, and then you know what to do. You are not somebody that can be stranded the way others are stranded. Hello? Things may not be working for others, but your own case is different. And one of the things God wants is that he wants you to be confident about it that your case is different. Say it like you mean it. My case is different. My case is different. Are you following me, Antonio? That you just know. Yes, I'm in Nigeria. Things are difficult for Nigeria. But my own case is different. Are you following me, Antonio? Why is your case different? There is a God that is working in your favor. There is an invisible person that is trying to make things happen for you. And he's not sleeping. The Bible says, He that keepeth Israel neither sleep nor slumber. And the Lord is my keeper. Okay, so let's look at another man called Isaac, who is the son of um, Abraham. G Genesis chapter 26. Are you there? Genesis chapter 26. Let's read verse 1. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistine, unto Gerah. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and I will bless thee. For unto thee and to thy seed I will give all this country, and I will perform the oath which I swear to your father. Jump from there to verse 12. Are you there? Verse 12. Can we read? Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Verse 13 together. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. Verse 14. For he had possession. Of flocks and possession of ants and great store of servants and the Philistines. You know, I think it is NIV that put it this way. It said, and the man prospered and continued to prosper until he became exceedingly prosperous. Excuse me, how can somebody be prospering when there was famine? Only God does that. Hello? Who does that? Hear me. During COVID lockdown, that things were difficult. Some people were made millionaires during COVID. <laughs> Are you following me at all? Some people were crying, hardship. Life is difficult. In that season was when God was raising some people. So this time that the same fuel went up, this is the season God will begin to raise you. Amen. I said, this season God will raise you. Amen. So you, you need to understand that the program is different. That's why the Bible says, why the multitude are saying there is a casting down for them. Then shall you arise and say there is a lifting up for you. What is the difference? God is the difference. Are you following me at all now? What's the difference? God is the difference. God is not planning that you will be put to shame. Rather, God is planning to make your life a showcase of testimony of his power. That why things, life is horrible and difficult, people who belong to God, God has them protected. He has things prepared for them. So we saw that, he said the eyes of God is looking at those who fear him and those who hope on his mercy so that he can keep them alive in famine. 
said in 16th year in seventh year, he will redeem you said that in times of famine he will redeem your soul from death that is his agenda that is his program once you belong to him he will ensure that your case is different so we've seen abraham we've seen isaac when we read in chapter 40 we'll see famine in the land of egypt and then i mean uh, uh, all over the world and it affected jacob and his children and God had to take them to Egypt and preserve them in Egypt. So while there was famine all around, there was surplus in Goshen. Are you following me at all? Because God was with them. Another interesting case is the case of the man called Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah had come up to say, look, because of the sin of the people, God was going to um, judge the people, and so there will be no rain. And because there was no rain, there was famine. And there was famine all over the land. But Elijah was taken care of. While everybody was hungry, God was sending a bird to come and feed Elijah. You don't know what it means. You see, this God that is called your father, eh? in the process of keeping you alive in famine, he can use any method to take care of you. Are you following me at all now? And not only can he, he will do it. It will work a miracle in your life to ensure that he takes care of you and show you that he is in charge. And then at a point, he just wanted to do another, another formula. So he told Elijah, I said, Elijah, leave the brook of chariots. I have commanded a widow in the city of Zarephath to take care of you. So go to Zarephath. I've commanded a widow there. How do you use a widow to take care of a grown man? Only God does this kind of thing. Hello? Because in farming, he will keep you alive. That is his strategy. So, we've laid two things down. First is to help us understand that farming is not new. That's times of scarcity, when things are not, when things are difficult, they are not new. They happen from time to time. It's like a cycle. Your father, if you ask your parents, they will tell you a time that this kind of thing happened to them. For those who have grown up in the 80s, there was what was called SAB, Structural Adjustment Program, during Babangida's time. It was very difficult for most people. Are you following me at all? So the, the cycle always comes. There are, there are seasons that things like this will come and it will be very hard. It will, look, if, it will even look as if people are going to die and truly some people will die. But it's only a season. That season, that phase will pass away and another one will come. That's the way it happens. But for you not to be destroyed, not to be uh, harmed during that season, you have to have your relationship with God. And when you have a relationship with God, there is hope that you cannot be having the same experience with other people. Because while others are saying there is a casting down for them, then you will say there is a lifting. So we are saying that the season of farming comes from time to time, and we are also saying that God has plans, special plans for people that belong to him. People that belong to God are not in the same category of, I mean, are not in the same category with people who do not belong to God. So your experience cannot be the same. Hello? So what are the things you are supposed to do, you that belong to God, to ensure that you play your part to survive famine? Because God has his part to play, and we have established from the scripture that God wants to keep you alive in famine. While things are difficult, God wants to ensure that your case is different. God wants to make sure, he has his plan already set, to make sure that while others are saying there's a casting down, you can arise and say there is a lifting up. But listen, every good plan of God is a two-way thing. There is a path for God to play and there is a path for man to play. We have said it over and over again that any religion that makes God alone absolutely responsible for your desired outcome without an input from you is an irresponsible religion. Are you following me at all now? I repeat, any religion that presents an impression that God alone, you have no impute at all. God alone is the only one that will take care of everything concerning your life. 
and you have no imputes is an irresponsible religion. Because what God does is that he does his own part and then energizes you, expecting you to also do your own part. There's a part for God to play and there's a part for you to play. When God plays his part and you play your part, it makes it come out well. Are we together? So we've seen that God's part is a settled deal. God has his mind made up. He's going to keep you alive in famine. He's going to ensure that the famine does not swallow you. But what are you expected to do? And for us to know what we are expected to do, I've always said it, make sure that every time you are in a crossroad on any issue of life, check those which has happened to you in the Bible. What did they do? Are you following me, Antonio? Anytime when you are in a crossroad, anytime you are, you are at a particular junction in your life and you, you are confused on what to do or what step to take, just check the scriptures. Check what has happened to people in the past. What did they do? And then you will get an insight about what you are supposed to do. Am I making sense of that? And so we want to look at it. What are we supposed to do during the times of famine so that you can survive famine and then you can navigate your way through the difficult times of famine? Number one is what you will see with a man called Abraham. God was saying to Abraham, get out of your father's house so you out of your country to a land that I will show. So the process is that God was the one that was showing Abraham where to go per time. Hello? Then we can see the same model with Isaac during the time of famine, that Genesis chapter 26, that God came and appeared to Isaac and God said, do not go to Egypt. Stay in the land that I will show you. Sojourn in this land. Take note of this. Your provision is tied to your place assigned by God. I repeat myself. Your provision is tied to the place that God has assigned for you. Every place is not your place. Are you following me at all now? Every place is not what? One of the greatest lessons you will learn in the journey of destiny is the lesson of specificity with God. Specificity of place. Everything about your life is connected to place, including church. Every church is not your church. Are you following me at all now? You see, a church may have everything right. Nothing is wrong with it. You know, doctrine is right. The atmosphere is right. The ambience is right. Everything about the church is right, but it's not your place. Hello? Nothing is wrong with the pastor. The pastor is anointed. Grace is there. But as far as heaven is concerned, for you, that's not your place. And to be in that place will be to be in the wrong place. Egypt, as of the time of Jacob, I mean, as of the time of um, um, Isaac, was like America. But that was not the place that was assigned for Isaac to go. His father went to Egypt even though God brought him out of Egypt. But for Isaac, he was not permitted to go to Egypt at all. God specifically told him, don't go down to Egypt. Stay in this land. So one of the first things you will do during the times that, when times are difficult, is to ask God, to keep checking with God, what am I supposed to do? Divine direction. Are you following me, Antonio? Divine direction. You cannot joke with divine direction during the times of famine. Because God knows exactly what you are supposed to do to bring your provisions out. If you miss it, you will suffer. And it will not be that the season is what is making you to suffer. It will be that you are not going to know what to do is what is making you to suffer. During famine, there is a need to stay very true and close to divine direction. Stay what? You have to stay true and close to divine direction. You need to know exactly what is God saying. What will God have me to do with regards to your location, with regards to your business, everything around you. You just want to know what is God saying to you. You may be doing a business now and the time, the anointing of God over that business has shifted and God has moved to something else. 
If you don't know, you will be struggling in the old business. Meanwhile, God's anointing has moved to a new business. Am I making sense at all now? So you want to know exactly, you want to get the divine direction clearly. The same God that was feeding Elijah by the brook of chariots, sending a raven, was the same God who told him, now move, because the, the, the brook had to dry up. The season of feeding him beside that brook had ended. Hello? And God said, hey, guy, move from here. Next place. The next place is go inside the city of Zarephath, and then I've prepared the widow there. I've commanded the widow there to take care of you. Some people will feel the pain and the heat of famine simply because they are missing divine direction. Can I beg with all of my heart this morning, please, more than anything in your life that you have ever done, this season, spend time in prayer a little, especially in, in praying in the Holy Ghost, so that you can get your, your spirit man alert to be able to get God's signal. Because just one slight signal that you miss can make you to suffer for two years. And it will not be that God, God intended you to suffer. It's just that you miss a signal. Simple. God says, go right. You choose to go left. And that's the end of your trouble. That's, that puts you into trouble. Now, the lesson I learned is that in the journey of your life, God has instruction for you per time. You must never miss it. Am I making sense at all? No? You must what? Never miss it. So in the times of famine, when it's difficult, the famine is hard. Don't be distracted and be saying and complaining what others are complaining. That's the point I'm trying to make. Don't begin to complain, ah, life is difficult, oh. No, no. Those are the times to say, Lord, what are you saying? Are you following me at all? No? It's time for to say, God, what do you want me to do? Where will you want me to go? What This business I'm doing, I hope I'm on track. Are there other things you are saying? Because it's not the time to complain. God already has it figured out how to take care of you in farming. So that's rule number one, during farming. For, because he has planned to keep you alive in farming. He has planned to redeem you during farming. So he cannot have that plan and allow you to die in farming. It doesn't work. Are you, are you still here? He has a plan for you. Hear this, look up. God never planned that you should be taking crumbs. It's never God's plan that you should be eating crumbs. No, 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 no. That's a far cry. That's not God's plan. It's never planned that you'll be eating crumbs. He has a great plan that your life should be glorious and better. And you've got to accept it. But it's on a condition he must lead the way. He must what? He must lead the way. So you put yourself in a situation where God can lead you. And that's one of the reasons why we take time to fast, we take time to pray, we take time to just stay by ourselves, you know. When, when you don't know what to do, sometimes you might just need to stay alone in your house. Are you following me at all now? And then if you cannot do it in your house, you can come to church, just be alone, lay on the altar, pray, and keep quiet for a while. So that your mind can be settled to be able to hear what God is going to say. And he's going to give you a signal. He will tell you this is the way walk in it. All right. Number two is to identify as you seek for divine direction, you must identify where God has assigned for you, what God has assigned for you. It's, it's like saying the same thing in two different ways. The first one is that you are asking God. The second one is that when God is to reply you, he's going to give you signals and you must be able to pick the signals. Are you following me at all now? You must identify your assigned place. You must identify the assigned things that God has for you. The assigned opportunities that God has for you. That means your spirit must be sensitive, alert. As you are asking God, you are alert to pick it, to identify it. Now look up, this is the way it works. Look up. If God wants you to start a new business, let's assume that God wants you to start selling rice. But presently now, you are employed as a secretary. When the season of famine comes, you're being a secretary, you start feeling uncomfortable. 
you will not know why you are uncomfortable. You will just, and what, what I mean by you are uncomfortable is that you just be unhappy. Two, it could ensure that in that office where you are secretary, everything is going against you. So everything is just... Now, once you are at that stage, what you need to do is separate yourself and spend time with God. Lord, what are you saying? Lord, what's your instruction? Lord, most often than not, I encourage people to pray a lot in the Holy Ghost. Pray a lot in the Spirit. Are you following me at all? And then, you then can pray in understanding and say, Father, I need your direction. What, is, what are you saying to me? If you are saying something, let me know. Make it clear to me. Open my eyes to see. Open my ears and all of that. While you are doing all of those prayers, God will go into your environment and your situation. And he will begin to point his attention on things that is related to his direction for you. It is at that time somebody can just suddenly come and say, Hey, can you say rice? The person goes. Maybe the thing didn't click in your mind. Then you just will watch a TV program. Then they will just be saying, rice is an essential commodity now. Anybody who knows how to sell rice can do this. And you say, ah, somebody was talking to me about rice yesterday. I'm watching television today. They are talking about rice. If that one doesn't click, you will just see a WhatsApp message that will be circulating. And then they will be talking about rice. As soon as you see that consistency of pattern, pay attention. Are you following me at all now? Because what is playing out for you there is a scripture that says, once has he spoken, twice have I heard. Are you following me at all now? And when God is moving, you cannot afford not to move, otherwise you'll be stranded. Because the way God led the children of Israel out of Egypt is that he led them by a pillar of cloud in the night and a pillar of fire, I mean, a pillar of cloud in the day, a pillar of fire by night. And the Bible says, whenever the cloud moves, they move. If he stayed, they stay. If the cloud stayed for one month, they stay for one month. If he stayed for one day, they stay for one day. The moment they see the cloud move, they move. And that cloud is a representation of the Spirit of God moving in your life. Are you following me at all now? So it is your responsibility to identify your own cloud. The cloud is a signal that God gives you. God will move around something that is related. If God needs you to move out of the present house that you are in, guess what he will begin to do? He will begin to make your landlord do, let me throw tantrums. Start doing some things. And then you'll be wondering what's happening here. You didn't offend. You didn't... Oh, it's not the landlord. Ask God. God, are you asking us to leave? And while you are praying and talking to God, you will just suddenly hear that the house is open. Nothing is wrong with your landlord, though. It's just God that wanted you to move. And when you are not picking signal on time, he has to make your landlord to make you to move. Are you still here with me? Sometimes we can be too comfortable with smallness. We can be too comfortable, sorry, with smallness. And God wants to move you to greater things. So he creates discomfort. So that you can be, you could be agitated. And in your agitation, you seek for God and he moves you to greater things. So it's your duty to identify what is God saying. Because in the midst of famine, where things are hard, God is shifting people. Some of you as you are here now, your assigned place is that you should start a business. But you have considered capital for a long time. Are you following me at all now? So in the midst of the hardship, if you can open your eyes, you will see what God is saying. Then you will just discover, that, oh, this is where God is leading me. And then the next thing is that you are there. I am praying for every one of you under the sound of my voice this morning. You won't miss your assigned place. Amen. You won't miss your assigned portion. Amen. Every portion of opportunity that the Lord has prepared for you, you will miss none of them. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Number two, number three. is for you to learn to manage and maximize the resources that God is bringing around you during famine. You see, usually, before famine, God starts to work. Most people don't know when famine is coming. And before famine, God would have been preparing you. You probably might just not have paid attention. But the moment famine comes, you've got to now start looking at the resources that God is sending you. I'm not saying you should be a miser. I'm not saying that you should be tight-fisted. But I'm saying that 
during famine is not the time to spend anyhow. Are you following me at all now? It's not the time to just uh, do things anyhow. You need to look at what you have and maximize it and manage it. And part of management might be that you may reduce your ration. Hello? Not out of fear, but out of the fact that you want to ensure that under God, you get the best. You see, when there is no famine, we have the tendency to waste. The tendency for waste is I. And one of the things God hates as a person, I'm getting to learn that a lot, one of the things God hates as a person is waste. You know, because it is surplus, you can presume that you don't need it. For example, some of us, you cook soup, and then you say because it's three days, you don't eat the soup of thought days, you know. <laughs> I met, I met somebody who said she does not eat soup of the next day. That it will be stale. <laughs> Are you following me? The, the soup has to be fresh. I'm not joking. No. And it's not that the, the person is very rich. Do you understand? Know but that's her. She said that's her policy. She does not eat the soup of the next day. And there are people like that. And what? <laughs> Hello. And what people don't know is that some of those habits like that, they actually lead people to trouble. Hello. Especially in the times of famine. Are you hearing me? So in the times of famine, you've got to check. Two, sometimes our stomach can be bigger than our destiny. Are you following me at all? There are some people that they can eat their future today. The house that they should build is in their stomach. Are you following me at all? You know, I, I used to preach for um, NUFCW people. It was while I was interacting with them that I know why many of them are poor. If you see the way they eat, I... They will not be pointing. Give me that one. Roundabouts. This one. And then one person, one big bowl of food, and then so many meats on it. And then the guy will sit down and eat everything. Are you following me at all? No? Do you notice that one primary wisdom that God gave Joseph to give Pharaoh in Egypt is that they should not consume everything they had. He told them in Egypt, said, save 20%. Are you following me at all now? Say, you can eat all, but don't eat everything. Save 20%. Did you, I don't know if you, I don't know how you read your Bible. Do you notice that the 20% that Egypt was saving for seven years was what was enough, not only to take care of Egypt, but to take care of other people that were coming to them? Because they were able to manage what they have. Let me tell you something. When you learn to manage what you have, even people who have more than you will think you have more than them. A good sense of management. Including the clothes that you wear, I'm talking about too. Because some people don't even know how to manage the clothes that they wear. Are you following me, Tono? In times of famine, you should learn more than ever before how to manage all that God has brought to your hand. And when I'm talking about you managing it, there are three things that are involved in that management. Number one is to understand the portion to consume. Understanding the portion to consume. And learn that it's not everything to be consumed. If you follow the way your stomach is doing you, your stomach will soon lead your destiny to trouble you. I'm not joking, no. I'm serious. If you follow the way the stomach is doing you, there are some people they will eat morning, afternoon, night, and it's no small ration, no big, big ration. Hello? Guess what I found out in my short journey of life? Highly successful people and great people, they don't eat much. They only eat balanced food. That's why you will go, why do you think they did buffet? In uh, places like 
Mario, Sharatin, and all of that. They didn't do buffet for poor people. They did buffet for rich people. You know why? Somebody can pay for buffet and enter the buffet room and pick only apple and tea. And the person is fine. <laughs> and it goes out. And then, you know, when you get there, you say, ah, ah, ah. He? With all this rice? With all this chicken? I will now come here. It's only apple I will pick. It's because you are still poor. <laughs> when God starts to increase your level, even food, you will see food now. It's not an issue for you. Are you following me at all now? And can I be honest with you? You don't need to be there financially in your pocket. You can train yourself to be there in your mind. You begin and train yourself to be there from your mind. Are you following me at all now? So that you, you start looking at what ration to take, what portion to take. Even for your spiritual health, it's not good to be eating morning, afternoon, night, every day of your life. Hello? There should be a season of your life where it's just only one meal. Just one, and you're okay. Because you won't die. It will amaze you how much your body really needs to survive. It doesn't really need much. And so, you've got to look at what to consume. In managing out your resources, you've got to look at what to invest. I tell people, invest before saving up. Because see, when you talk about saving, except you are saving to accumulate enough to invest. Hello? That you are saving money, what, what does it give you much? Nothing much, except you invest it. What is investment? Say you, you put money in something that makes money to multiply. That's basically investment. You put money in something that makes the money to go and work and multiply. And, I'm, and when I'm talking about investment, I'm not talking about tap tap. <laughs> Those ones are gamble. You know, you are gambling. I'm not talking about uh, Naira Beds, Babai Jebu, those kind of things. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not investment. That's gambling. And gambling can make you poor. Are you following me at all? I'm not talking about gambling. Okay. Yes, I know that you want to tell me that some people have made money from gambling. Go and check what gambling does for them. It gives them an habit, which is habit of gambling, an addiction that will ultimately make them to gamble away everything that they have gotten. Are you following me at all now? So gambling doesn't... I'm, I'm talking about proper investment. And I, when I'm also talking about investment, I'm not talking about those ones that, this one that people will come and give you fake, uh, you know, there are, there are positive multi-level marketing, but there are many fake multi-level marketing. That is just that they are gathering other people's money to pay some. They pay some of you. Say, bring five people. When you bring five people, then they will give you 200,000. You know, each person will register with 150,000. So if you bring five people, once you gather your own five, they will give you 200,000. And then you gather 10 people. You make the five to gather five, five. Then you will now increase to, it's a lie. It's thief, stealing. <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> that, that's not... That's not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm talking about investment that is solid. Is that they are selling something, they are buying something, they are providing a service, and your money is there and is helping to make that sale to grow so that as everybody have profit, you also have profit. Am I making sense to somebody at all? Okay, so, and then you then now begin to think of saving because also you must save Sometimes for the raining day, sometimes from hard days. Let me tell you this. Look up. Learn never to eat with ten fingers, no matter how difficult. Did you hear what I said? Learn never to spend all your money, no matter how difficult. I, I learned this several years ago, and it has helped me. No matter how much you are having, Make sure that what you consume is not everything. There should be a portion of it that you are putting into something that can multiply. There should be something. You may not have it in bank, but it might be on stock. 
It might be that you buy a land somewhere. It might be you do something somewhere. But never allow it to be that you eat with all your fingers. Because when the major opportunities will come your way sometimes, you will need some of those fallback. So learn to manage well. All right, let's move on. Number five, you know, we're looking at how do you navigate the seasons of farming. Number five. Yeah, are you sure? I talked about divine seeking God. Oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. I missed something. Number four, number four. Uh, that should have actually be number three. I think I, I skipped it. Keep making efforts, productive efforts during your farming period. And that's a lesson we learned from Isaac. Isaac sowed in the land in the year that was farming. Isaac did two things during farming period. He sowed and he dug well. He was planting. There was farming. Isaac was planting. You know, during farming period, people are discouraged from doing productive things. Because they, keep, they just simply believe that nothing will work. But Isaac kept taking productive effort. I have found this to be true. Look at me. No matter how difficult the times are, keep looking for what you can do productively. Even when it's not bringing you money. Just keep doing something productive. Make sure you are engaging yourself in something productive. I, I, was, I was teaching in the workers' meeting this morning, and I was, I was showing them from this end, that there is nothing that is free. Come and ask me. I've, I mean, I ran an NGO that we have done a lot of free things, and we still do a lot of free things. Free seminar, free training, free, free almost everything. But you know, in my experience, I have found out that those things that I did that I thought were free, they were actually not free. They were investments. Some of them paid me 10 years later. Some of them paid me 20 years later. Somebody would just say, ah, that's the man that did this thing in uh, 2000 and so, 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 so. I said, ah, yeah, that man, he's been doing that thing for a while. He can do it. And that just gave me open doors freely. Because by virtue of what I've been doing that looks free, I have gained a repetition for mastery. Are you following me at all now? So whatever you are doing, even in your place of work, you know, it looks as if they are not paying you now. There's a way God has wired the ecosystem of the universe that you must be paid for everything that you did. Somehow, somehow, nature will pay you back. It may not be in the same place. It may not be the same person, but nature will pay you back. So what do you, what do, you do? During farming period, don't fold your hands. When things are difficult, don't get into lethargy and say, oh, Keep looking for something productive that you'll be doing. Let no day pass by that you are not doing something. You are not engaging yourself in something productive. Find a work, something that you'll just be doing. Yes, everybody may abuse you now that you are not getting money from you. Don't worry. They don't understand. When the reward will come, that's when they will envy you. Are you following me at all now? Just keep doing your own. Just keep doing your own. Keep putting in your effort. Isaac sowed in the land in the year that there was famine. And then while everybody didn't have an harvest, Isaac had an harvest. Number two, why nobody was digging? Isaac was digging. He was digging well. Nobody was digging well. Isaac was digging well. And he was finding water. Because, you see, your case is different when you, when you belong to God. So your effort will not be allowed to go in vain. Are you following me, Antonio? So in the times of famine, while others are discouraged and they are not doing anything, don't follow them. Don't join them in that discouragement. You keep finding something to do. Because God had vowed himself that for those who belong to him, he will bless the work of your hands. So just keep doing your own. Don't worry. The money is not the problem. Just keep doing something. Whatever God will give you to do, keep doing it. That's why the Bible says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. Let me also tell you one secret I found with work. When you are doing something productive, there is somebody that is watching what you are doing that you don't know. And those who are watching what you are doing will be people God will use to go and announce you in quarters that matters. They have mentioned my name in places that I receive call and I'm wondering, who told you about me? They say somebody, so, and I'm like, ah, from where to where? They say, yes, if we, are, if we are watching you, we know, we know what you are doing. I've gotten to some places that people I don't even expect to know. They say, ah, we know you. They say, how ah, did you know me? They say, ah, we, 
what you things about that you do. Are you following me at all now? So those things that you are doing that look as if they are nothing, it's a lie, oh. Somebody's watching. So keep productively getting engaged yourself. All right, number five. Engage in spirit-led giving. Engage yourself in spirit-led giving. You see, during the times of famine, most people with old, most people will keep back. Look up. Let me tell you a simple principle with God. This is the way God works. Look up. God has his own economic system and structure. If you don't follow God's economic system, you'll be stranded. What's God's economic system? God's economic system is that he wants you to know he is your supplier, is your source. He wants you to know that. So how do you prove that? Number one, God, come on. God will give you, look up, he gives you one, two, three. And then he tells you, for you to acknowledge that I am a supplier, give me part of what I give you. That's why we tell people that it doesn't matter what they say on social media. Your tight, no wait, your tight is not, is not a gift to God. Are you following me at all now? It's not, it's not you're dashing God. It's a debt you pay as honor to God to, to reflect that he is your source. That's why you add that Jacob was saying to God, God didn't come to tell him that. But he has seen his father practice his, seen his grandfather practice it. So he told God, he said, God, if you would take me to that place and bring me back, he said, I will give you a tenth of all that you give me. Because Abraham did the same thing. Abraham must have passed it to Isaac. And then from Isaac, Jacob must have learned how it is done. Is somebody with me at all now? Before God now established it for the children of Israel, and God now said, the tithe of the land belongs to God. So the first thing is that as he's giving you things, Learn to maintain a practice of honoring him back out of what he has given you. That's why David was saying, of all that you have given us, we are giving back to you. For none of us ask what to give you except what you have given to us. Are you still with me here? All right. Now, when you do this to God, guess what God feels? God sees you as a trustworthy person. So what does he do? He opens more opportunities to give you. Why is God interested in this? You know, somebody said, no, let them not. <laughs> I remember a man was talking. It's transactionary gospel. God does not need to give him. It's a lie. God needs you to give him, and I'll prove it to you. Your giving to God is a demonstration of your submission and acknowledgement that is the one that is providing for you. Meanwhile, God does not need it. Are you still with me here? He doesn't need it. He expects you to do it because your doing it is what you used to prove on earth that you acknowledge that he exists are we together you are acknowledging that you exist that's why when you are giving to god what matters to god in what you are giving him is honor what matters to him so if you give to god and honor is not in it he won't take it that was the problem of Cain. The Bible says, by faith, Abel brought a more honorable sacrifice unto the Lord than his brother Cain. So God had respect for his offering. He didn't have for. How do we know that? Malachi chapter 1, God was talking about it. He said, when you bring lame, you bring the lion, you bring all kind of nonsense offering to my altar. He said, do you want me to take that? He said, can you give it to your governor? said, I am a great king, and my name is to be honored on all, in all of the earth. So the rule is you must practice honoring God. So uh, Proverbs chapter 3, um, I think verse 9, Solomon now told us, he said, honor the Lord with your substance and the first fruit of your increase. He said, what will not happen? Then your band will be filled with plenty. That's the first rule. You must honor God with what he gives to you. Come on, say, I honor God. With what he gives to me. Number two is that from 
what you have that God is blessing you with, God does not want you to be a lake. Because the style of God is that God will use men to bless men. Even you, God will not break heaven and pour pounds, sterling, and dollars for you. How will God bless you? He will send somebody to come and give you something or give you an opportunity. Now, for it to be easier for God to keep the system running, He needs you. Um, but if you come, um, let me pick some other person. Okay, I've got in one minute. Okay, Daniel, come. Let's 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 do that. One. It's actually the two of you are wearing white. So let's let's go it this way. So God gives you this, and it's in His mind. Give Him two. So, I give you this more. Give him one. So, in God's mind, he expects the things to be exchanged. So, give him one. Mm -mm, wait. Give him one. Give him the two that you have. Do you get the logic now? Yes, now, it looks as if he has nothing. And God will not tell him. Give him, give her two. Give him one. Can you see how that thing is exchanging? On this earth, God is not spending money. On this earth, God is not spending houses. What God makes those things to do is to exchange from hands to hands. Are you here? Every land that you see today was first somebody's property 100 years ago. Are you following me at all now? And so what God does is that he takes it from men and gives it to men. And the way he does it is that he puts his spirit and compels people. That's why he said, Jesus was saying, give. And it shall be given to you, good measure, press down, shaking up. Shall men be commanded to give to you? Sometimes some people, they don't want to give to you, but God will compel them to give to you. And they will have no choice. Are you following me at all now? Now, for you to be in a situation where God's power can force people. I don't know if you have ever been in a situation where people are forced to give you before. Uh, I've been there. Somebody has come before and say, I'm not happy to give you this thing, but I will not rest. <laughs> And now you're happy or you're not happy. It's not the issue. <laughs> the issue is that you should give it. God loves both cheerful and tearful giver. <laughs> are you following me at all now? So, there are, there are times God, on your behalf, will go and meet somebody and withdraw their sleep. There is an uncle somewhere. There is a boss somewhere. There is a rich man somewhere. He will just lose his sleep. All that God will put in his mind is your thoughts. And until he has done you good, you will have no rest. Are you following me at all now? There is a power and energy from God that does that. Now that energy responds to your habits of allowing God to flow through you. What you have not allowed God to make happen through you to others, God cannot make happen to you. So the question is that when was the last time you allowed God to touch your heart? To look at a brother that doesn't have shoe and you are moved to go and give them shoe. Thank you. Are you following me at all now? When, when my, my second son called me and said, Daddy, aside from the scholarship they gave me in the school that he got scholarship in the U.S., they gave me another, this thing. So you don't need to pay anything. And you know what God said to me? He said, do you remember how many children I've used you to give scholarship to? I'm only paying you back. Your children can never suffer or be stranded anywhere in the world. Guess what? Since 2006, I've been supporting indigent children in school. Sometimes I'm begging for money from people 
to be able to send other children in school. There was one time my, one of my sons was reminding me. They sent my child out of school. My child was not in school. Yet, I was soliciting money to pay school fees for some children. Are you going to say that? And why? I knew for my child, God is too faithful to leave my child out of school, that my child will go back to school. But this one doesn't have help. Are you still here? In the mind of God, he wants to use you to be a blessing, so he will bring resources to your hand. And sometimes in famine, when there is lack, is when God will be asking you for the little that you have. That's what I'm trying to say to you. How do you ask a widow to feed a prophet? A widow that doesn't have husband. And the only one that she has, you now ask her to go and give to the prophet. It wasn't the prophet that said she should do it. It was God. Hello? Because God told Elijah, he said, go to the widow. I've, go to Zarephath. I have commanded a widow to feed you there. Now, when God is asking you during famine, please take note is that he wants to preserve you. Because only the time that you are having that famine, the little saving that you have, God can ask you, give it to me. And you know, it will look as if God is wicked. It's not to. He just wants to preserve your future. Are you still with me at all? There is famine. Everybody is finding it difficult to eat. And then the little congo of rice that you have, God will now show you one uh, family that is not far from your house. And God, God will say, divide the congo of rice to two. Go and give them half. Sometimes he can even ask you to divide it to 20, 80. Go and give them 80% and manage the 2%. And then you'll be like, if I, if, I, if I go and give them this 80%, what will I eat next? God said, don't worry. You just first go and obey me. Meanwhile, you obey God so that a bag of rice can come in. Are you still with me at all now? During famine, be sensitive to spirit-led giving. Because that's the way God works. God will use you to preserve other people. So your little will become God's answer in their lives. So that God can pick somebody else to come and answer your own prayer. Are you still here? That's the way it works. Number six. Let's quickly round up. Stay fresh in faith. Stay what? Stay fresh in faith. You must keep trusting God even in famine. In 2 Kings chapter 7, the man who was leaning, who was a counselor to the king when Elisha was talking, his problem was that he couldn't, tr- he couldn't see how God was going to turn around the captivity. Elijah, Elisha came and said, by this time tomorrow, surplus will be there because God would have intervened. And the guy said, Abba, Abba, prophet, Abba, Abba. Stop giving us. How, how can you say that kind of thing? Even if God were to open the window of heaven, it won't happen. And then the prophet said, hey, you doubted God that much. You will see it, but you won't eat out of it. This is one of the problems of a lot of people during famine, including Christians. Because our minds, we think that God is limited by our own limitation. Never allow your mind to make you start doubting God. It doesn't matter how bad it is. Keep believing God that even in the diff- most difficult of all times, God is going to do something. Friends, can I tell you something? I've been so much in many situations that will look like I will drown in famine. And just by just trusting God and believing in him, I've seen God do strange things. My wife, when my wife first started with me, she, used to, she was telling church one time. She said she used to just wonder. Because I'll say, we will see God. She's asking me, how do we solve this problem? How do we? I said, don't worry, we'll see God. <laughs> you grab that. So she, she'll be like, ah, you are telling me we'll see God. What I'm interested in is that what is the practical steps? <laughs> but I, I don't know. I don't know how. But I know that God knows what to do. Can I be honest with you? God is not just going to be thinking of what to do about you. He knows exactly what to do. And he will never fail nor keep you stranded. The psalmist says, once I was young, 
But now I am old. By experience, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children beg for bread. In other words, God is ever faithful that no matter the circumstance, he won't allow you to get to the point where you'll be stranded and you'll be begging for bread. <laughs> if you will only trust him. If you will trust him. If you will trust him. Jesus, the Son of God, I believe in you. I believe in you. That, that you are saying, Lord, I believe you strongly. I'm coming back to that because that's, that's where I will finish so that I can. Number seven is that pay attention to relationships that are destiny relationships during farming season. Listen, before the farming comes and during the farming, there are people God will send to your life. Just like I was telling you about you engaging in spirit-led giving. In the same way, there are people that God has sent ahead of your journey whose job is to take care of you. Some of them is that they will give you opportunities during farming. And those opportunities will bring money, resources into your life that will make you to, I mean, to survive farming. Some of those people will come into your life and then they will bring food. You know? That's what God will just send them to bring it. Some of them will be a bridge. They will connect you to opportunities or connect you to other things that will make the period in your life pay attention to them. What the brothers of Joseph never knew was that Joseph was designed to preserve them. So guess what God did? As they were selling Joseph to slavery, Joseph was being positioned to be able to provide food for them. In fact, Joseph made a very interesting statement that I'd like you to quickly see. Genesis 45. Genesis chapter 45. Listen to, listen to Joseph here. Genesis chapter 45. Joseph made something, made a very interesting statement here. Are you there? Let's, let's read from verse 10. Genesis chapter 45. Okay, no, before you get to verse 10, let me first show you verse 6 to 7, then we'll get to verse 10. Verse 6 to 7. Let's first look at verse 6 to 7. For these two years have the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be Erring nor others. Read verse 7 loudly. And God is, eh? Again? Uh huh. Yeah. So God, so God sent him ahead. Now let's jump to verse 10. 10 to 11. Want to go? Yeah. Yeah, down. Verse 11. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love KJV. He said, I'll provide for you there, lest you come to poverty. So the famine could have made everybody poor. But there was a relationship to preserve them. You know, two major prayers, you know, three major prayers I will want to pray in this service. One is, Lord, let me not miss your direction for me in this season. Second prayer that you will pray is, Lord, let my faith and confidence in you this season not shake. The third prayer is that, Lord, every relationship that you have assigned to keep me in this season, Lord, help me to be able to identify them. Are you following me at all? In season of famine, you can live like someone who is not experiencing famine. Reason being that once you have a relationship with God, God has your back up. Jesus, the Son of God, I believe. 
Jesus, Jesus, the Son. 